when you have a fighting style that is um, is filled with respect and um, human dignity and kindness, then you get closer from argument. Welcome to Spiritually Hungry. Do you know what today is? It's uh, a day of love. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I think chocolates, flowers, Hallmark commercials. Some people are anxious. Hallmark commercials, they still even exist. They must exist somewhere. So the Hallmark channel. That's where they exist. <laughs> Those are good commercials. Really? I don't remember any of them. I don't know if I've ever seen them. Make you cry. <laughs> really? I don't think so. Some are anxiously awaiting this day with antici anticipation and excitement. Others are maybe dreading it if they don't uh, have a date or have enough um, love for themselves or in their lives. When you fall in love, it's temporary madness. Do you remember feeling like that? I do. I still feel like that. Oh, it erupts like an earthquake and then it subsides. And that's just the beginning phase of love, but that's the one most people talk about. It's this euphoric feeling. And when that goes away, a more profound love must emerge. And that's called unconditional love. Unfortunately, it usually doesn't, right? <laughs> that's the bad news. And we hardly hear people talking about unconditional love. It's certainly not in um, maybe some books, but movies, the romantic movies, it's never really like the unconditional love because that would require showing what it takes to get there. And that's going to be ups and downs it's and highs and lows and effort. And also it's not, yeah, it's not exciting enough perhaps. So we know, again, love is one of the most widely written topics in the world. It's the impetus for so many of our favorite stories, songs, movies, and art because it's something we all dream of. So everybody has this in common. Finding that one special person who makes your heart sing and discovering that as though it's written in the stars that they love you too. Oh, you share a dramatic kiss in the rain or against the backdrop of a rosy pink sunset, just like in the movies. But what happens after the sunset? What happens after that kiss in the rain? We'll never know because they don't show us that part of the film. <laughs> What we see in the movies is our society's idea of romantic love and passionate attachment between two people. We have to understand this isn't the end of the story. It's really only the beginning. So this Valentine's Day... Not only is it, the, is it just the beginning, it might be a separate book. It's unrelated to the second part. Yes. The true love story. Maybe. Um, so especially on Valentine's Day, we're inundated with this topic and with this subject and... Again, the focus is on all the things we daydream about. Um, and we're also taught that falling in love means following your heart. That love, by definition, is somehow mystical and beyond reason. But if it's love we feel, we do feel it for a reason. I think that often we're not in touch with what that is, though. And that's where we get into trouble. So before we get into, I think we're each going to share three lessons that ideas, we've... Yeah, lessons. Okay, call it I an have idea. one story and three it. ideas. I don't know if you're going to get to all of that. But um, growing up, was there a particular movie, book, or song that created the strongest image or sentiment for you about what the ideal love looked like or felt like? I never asked you that question. No, because because I think I'm going to give you a very boring answer. I'm, and I'm, that I'm is... counting on it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure our listeners will be entertained. But the reality is that growing up, I don't think I don't think that that wasn't really a focus of uh, the way I saw my time spent. So, of course, well, I'm being honest. Ever? To, no, of course. What, what, what did you think? How how are you going to have a family? <laughs> <laughs> of course, it was there, right? But it wasn't that. Oh, I saw this movie or I read this book, and suddenly, you know, I had this dream. Um, I always saw it as a progression, right, and as part of 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 what I would say, my spiritual life. Did you ever picture that part of your life? Probably, but in vague, vague, vague ways. You just not, get there when you get there. Yeah, not concrete ways. Because again, for me, my focus was my spiritual growth and development. And I knew, and I believe very strongly still to, the, to this day, that it's that internal focus that allows one to truly both experience love and most importantly, maintain a loving relationship. 
boring? Mm. Mm. Honest, yeah. Well, what, slightly. Well, let me ask you the same bland. question. <laughs> Fine. Do you have a better, more exciting? No, answer? it's not better. I don't. I don't have a specific thing. I just remember things that made my heart feel. Mm -hmm. And then I would daydream about when I would have that experience. You know, for I example, wanted that feeling. Uh, for example. They're just different moments in a movie. They, were, they weren't necessarily love stories. I don't think I ever bought into the happily ever after bit, mm -hmm. like it was sold. But I did want to feel that kind of love where you felt like you couldn't be without the person. That Can was I share something that you might not want me to share? Oh, there's something called edit. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, so, and again, this is kind of a weird story. Um, Why wouldn't I want you to share it? Well, Why is it weird? Is it about me? Out. It's definitely about you. So, our son David is, is has spent some spending some time in your mom's house in Los Angeles, and somehow, and it's still not clear to me how he got his hands on your diaries. Yeah, because my mother probably showed him where it was. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, completely inappropriate. But we were just we were just together at the spiritually hungry retreat in Mexico, <laughs> and he yes, it was amazing. He shared with me that he was reading your diaries of during the time that we were dating. Mm -hmm. And 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 one of your diary entries, and again, I, I'm I'm not sure this is the exact quote, but this is the general tenor of the message that your it was in the, sort of somewhere in the middle of the night, and your heart was beating, uh, thinking about me. <laughs> oh, you love that! Out of all the things that you decided to repeat, way, completely inappropriate. The, I think that David's reading the diaries, journal. But I thought it was very interesting. You're so funny. You pick the thing that's just about you. <laughs> it's about you. It's not about <laughs> me at all. It's about you. Oh, Michael. All right. Well, the first thought that I had, but do you want to go first? Yeah. Well, actually, the first thing I want to say is completely, it, there's no lesson here, but I just thought it was really interesting and I wanted to share it. So, you know, in today's modern world, this is the story. This is kind of a story, a uh, historical moment where, you know, we, we read this every day a new book on relationships comes out. Of course, uh, there's a lot of books, a lot of studies that, that happen around this topic. But the reality is that up until really the mid 70s, 1970s, this was not a topic that was much studied, certainly in the scientific world, and wasn't much written about. So the story goes to, and this really is kind of the, the moment when the study of relationships, at least in sort of in the, in the academic and scientific world, began. And this is the story. In 1974, uh, a U.S. Senator, William Proxmire of Wisconsin, he believed that there was a lot of waste that was going on uh, with public money, with the, with the government's money. So he launched a campaign against the study of love. He was the, a member of the Senate, Senate Finance Committee, and he took it upon himself to find any places where the government was wasting money. And he found out that the National Science Foundation, a federal body that funds research and promotes scientific progress, had given $84,000 grant to Dr. Ellen Bershide, who was a psychologist at the University of Minnesota, to find out the science of romantic love. So when Proxmire discovered this, he said that this work was frivolous and tax dollars were being ill spent. So he didn't have a love, of, feeling a lot of love in his heart. <laughs> no, the publicity that was given Proxmire's pronouncements not only cast a pall over the behavioral science research, it set off an international firestorm around Bershide that lasted the next two years. Mm. So because of this, she went through a really challenging two years. Um, colleagues were fired. Her office was swamped with hate mail. She even received death threats. Wow. Yeah. But this is crazy. Yes. But in the long run, the strategy backfired. Much to Proxmire's chagrin, it generated, the, it generated increased scientific interest in the study of love, propelling it forward, and identified Bershide as the keeper of the flame. Scholars and individuals from Alaska and then the darkest Cold War Albania sent her requests for information along with letters of support. Bershide jettisoned her plans for early, very early retirement, and as she said, became a clearinghouse for North American love research. It became eminently dear, sorry, clear that there were people who really did want to learn more about love, and I had tenure. So it's interesting. I think this story is fascinating on many levels. I'm not sure how much it teaches about about love, but that in that moment, in 1974, where Senator Proxmire was trying to extinguish all study and money spent on, on 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 studying love really became the the inflection point where you know Dr. Bershide herself but then of course many others joined her in the study of love if not for Dr. for Senator Proxmire mm -hmm. probably all the research that has been done since 
around love and relationships that hopefully helps all the world and all of us experience better and more love and better relationships would never have happened. I love so I when people try to do not great things. I love when it backfires. Exactly. <laughs> I think that's that, that's that's what it's for me. It's not just a lesson about love. It's a lesson about life. That that often it is those moments of struggle when people are coming at you that actually are the impetus or the moment when great revelations occur. Yeah, well, the real key is those two years, you know, where where did she, where was her she could have given up. headspace? She kept persevering. How hard was it? You know, did she have doubt? Yeah, good lesson. The first idea that I have about love is that it's a process, not a destination, and the process starts with you. I often, so many people come to me for advice. We always begin with this conversation, even if they don't realize it. I let them talk about whatever the issue is for about 20 minutes, and then I come in with this conversation. Nurturing the relationship means continuing to put as much effort into it as we did finding it. And unfortunately... Or even more. The reality is probably even more. So no matter where you are in your love story, ask yourself what you believe about love. And I really encourage our listeners to do that right now. Do you believe that once you find the one, your life will finally begin? Do you believe that if your partner was more affectionate, supportive, or different somehow, that your relationship would flourish? Do you believe that you choose... Do you believe that you chose the wrong person and that you'll be happier with someone else? Do you believe that your partner should always make you happy? And to do this, right, this is why a relationship with self Can is I important. Can I add another, another question? Sure. Do you believe that your partner is the source of all of your happiness and or upset? Did you have that one? Well, I just said, do you believe that your partner should always make you happy? Yes. But I'm the going source to... of, you added right. upset. No. <laughs> Okay, yeah. Let's let's pretend like you came up with that question. <laughs> let's have a big fight on our episode on love. No, but m my point is that it's not just. What, what was the question that you that you had? Oh, you're really butchering this uh, up <laughs> Thank here. You. The one I that our the, listeners the, are loving. The last one that I just yes. said twice that you changed and exactly, I'm going to say exactly. it again for the third yes. time. Do you believe that your partner should always make you happy? Exactly right. That's different than asking whether you the believe the source of your happiness. The total source of your happiness. And oh, now you added the word total. <laughs> okay, upset. I didn't add. Yes. So that's a new. No, no, but again, because I, we do know people. We assign them. We assign them to that, be. That, that the, I believe a big part of uh, issues that come up in relationships is when the individual thinks that for some reason, which just doesn't make any logical sense, because they're married now, their spouse, partner, is now the, should, needs to be. The responsible source, for responsible all. Responsible for all that makes them happy. And by the way, and I've also on the other hand, sometimes people are unhappy and they happen to be in a relationship and they blame all of their unhappiness on their partner, not addressing the fact that they're not happy as an individual and they happen to also be married or be in a relationship as opposed to saying, one second, maybe I'm responsible for my happiness and maybe my unhappiness is not completely the responsibility of my but partner. Here's the problem. So that last question. The first question was, do you believe that once you find the one, your life will finally begin? So if your answer is yes to that, then of course, that last question is going to be your reality at some point, because all of these feelings, all of these examples are an illusion. Of course, you need to be all of this for yourself, preferably before you go out to seek the one, so you can find a person that's really going to be where you are at in your headspace. If, for instance, and this is what is so ridiculous about this, if you think on some level you'll finally be happy after you meet the one, what state are you in right now? And what kind of person are you drawing towards you? What level of relationship will you experience if that's how you go into it? Right. So to that point, I think it's really important thought for each one of our listeners to say, especially those who are struggling in a relationship, the first question you should ask yourself is, am I a happy person on my own? Even if I'm in a relationship. And then you can try to understand how the relationship can get better. But if you're honest with yourself, you will often find that if you're upset, or you're disappointed, or you're unhappy, a lot of it has to do just with you. I mean, break it down, really. If you think that your happiness is on is based on if somebody's going to appear in your life, or how they behave well, even, towards even you, once they're in, right? even or once they're all in. of that. I mean, then how much of your power are you giving over? And that's why people get really messed up in relationships when they find themselves really unhappy or dissatisfied. Because again, the euphoric stage will go away. And then you're left with all of these feelings that were always there, but you didn't have access to. And again, it comes back to us. You need to be that for yourself. And, again, and unfortunately, often one will blame their partner 
for their internal unhappiness, even though it has nothing to do with their partner. Right. So I call this ego-based love, not unconditional love. When you shift your focus from finding the one to being the one, that's when profound transformation begins to occur. This is what it means to rethink the love in your life. It means uncovering your beliefs, stories, and illusions and letting them go and taking responsibility for yourself, for your life, for your happiness. It means examining what you're bringing into your relationship. How many times in a day are you thinking about sharing with them? How are you loving them? And communicating effectively to understand what your partner is bringing. This internal work is never complete. It's ever evolving and our relationships are intended to be as well. Individuals evolve individually so that they can evolve together. And I'll quote my book, love is more than just a feeling. It's a process requiring continual attention. So, I want to ask you another question here. Can you share an example of something you felt was lacking at a certain point in our relationship? How either you shifted the focus to appreciation or focused on giving what you felt was lacking for me? Ask it again. It was a very long question. Can you share an example of something you felt was lacking at a certain point in our relationship and what shifted? Or maybe you focused on giving what you felt was lacking for me. So was it a shift that came from me or was it something that you... Well, first I'll say that I don't think I've ever felt any in our relationship there was anything lacking. Really? <laughs> no, I don't think that's true. <laughs> <laughs> so now you're a liar on top of it. Okay. Let me think. Let me think. Um, I mean, I think there's always desire yeah, for course, more, wanting desire. more. Yeah, but I, I mean, guess lack sounds really kind of. Ha- this is a test, yeah. by the way. It's a test. Oh, <laughs> did I fail? Yeah. Um, well, I'll use this, uh, an example. Which again, I'm not sure it illustrates this point, but I thought, it was, but it's related to it, and that is that. Um, so yesterday we had an argument. Do you Let remember? me just think for a second. Yesterday, yesterday. yesterday. yes, I do. Yeah. And um, going into the argument, I was. You're sure you were right. Well, not just that I was right. <laughs> no, right? You were not. <laughs> That's not the point. Uh, I was right though. Um, no, you weren't. But I had a point also. <laughs> yes. Listen, let me finish. Um, and I was went into the argument, and it was an important conversation with you know, um, but thinking that you weren't open to my side of the of the of the argument, and then my one takeaway after we had the argument one is that I really enjoyed arguing with you. <laughs> I guess when you're in love, you enjoy even the arguments. But second, I really appreciated your after the the argument your point of view and the strength of your point of view your your even again even though i think you know if i if i were to gauge and it's hard for our listeners to understand this if i'm we're not talking about specifics but if going into it i thought i was 90 not 95% right and you were 5% right after the argument i felt you were 49% right and i was 51% right but be that as it that's not, my point is that I think that when you're, and this is where 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 I went through in in my process, is that when you're when you have true love and respect, then you actually enjoy sometimes after the fact the the areas of confrontation. Well, you didn't really answer the question, but I like your answer. You're welcome. Um, I think though that when you when you have a fighting style that is um is filled with respect and um human dignity and kindness then you get closer from arguments yeah and it's the point i really i really had besides i really like i was thinking after the argument like i really i felt even greater love towards you because of the argument which is kind of strange but but true and uh, <laughs> whoa, why are you laughing i don't know if people are going to understand you really huh? um and I had more respect for you even after. It just it was, it was a really interesting, uh, interesting process. Interesting. Yeah. All right. So now you give me a, a lesson. Okay. So in love. Yes. So one of there's a beautiful book called The Art of Loving by Eric Fromm, a very uh, well known. He was a psychoanalyst. He was a, he, he was he wrote many many books, and one of them is in The Art of Love, and it's really to the point that you made. But I think. This maybe adds another layer to it. So he writes, and I do recommend this book, by the way. The number one relationships book, of course, is Rethink Love. And I would put this up there in the top three. 
Um, is, so he asks, is love an art? Then it requires knowledge and effort. Or is love a pleasant sensation? Which is an experience, which which to experience is a matter of chance, something one falls into if one is lucky. This little book is based on the former premise, meaning that love is an art, and therefore it requires knowledge and effort. While undoubtedly the majority of people today believe in the latter, and if you think about that, it's really a profound statement that most people don't view love as an art; they view it as an experience, and sometimes a lucky experience. Not that people think that love is not important. They are starved for it. They watch endless numbers of films about happy and unhappy love stories. They listen to hundreds of trashy songs about love. Yet hardly anyone thinks that there is that there is anything trashy that needs, songs. Yeah, there are some trashy songs. Well, some great songs about love. Too. Yes. Okay. <laughs> you just got me there. I'm trashy songs. People listen to trashy songs about not me. Sir Eric Fromm is saying. Um, yet hardly anyone thinks that there is anything that needs to be learned about love. This peculiar attitude is based on several premises which either singly or combined tend to uphold it. Most people see the problem of love primarily as that of being loved. Right? When somebody has a problem mm-hmm. with love, it's not that they have, they're not even thinking about the fact that, am I developing my love for others? Right? They're thinking about, am I being loved? Rather than that of loving, of one's capacity to love. Hence, the problem to them is how to be loved, how to be lovable. And I think that's yeah, because it's, it's the, the theme of our lives. It's all about the I-ness of my experience exactly. with everything, right? Exactly. And so I'd like to really, really for our listeners to take a moment to think about this. Love is an art, which means it needs to be learned, it needs to be practiced. And you talk about this all the time, right? The, the, it's so silly for anybody going into a relationship, going into marriage one year, five years, thinking that they're going to be good, any good at it, especially, mm-hmm. especially. If there isn't the understanding that because love is an art and therefore it takes learning and practice, ask yourself the question: You're in a relationship for one day, you're in a relationship for one year. How are you perfecting your skill? Exactly. What well, are you like? If, if you want, if you want to learn tennis, nobody's going to say. Except you know, said our, our son, our son. is like that. <laughs> it's funny. We went again we, when we were at the spiritually hungry retreat. Yeah, <laughs> did you tell see the what story. happened? No, tell me the story. He okay. told me, but you probably you were there. Oh, I was the there. Story. So he takes out this. <laughs> it's not even like. It's kind of like a wind surfer. Yeah. Bow. It's like Sur- the net, right, with the two floaties on the. It's like, like a, a catamaran square, type. kind of, and it yeah. has a sail. Okay, yeah. and you take an oar. So call it a sail. No, it doesn't have an oar. It has like a paddle that you that you maneuver with your hands. Yeah, built-in paddle on the boat, right? Yeah. Basically, a but sailboat. you need the wind. Yes, exactly. So he's like, oh yeah, I caught it. Whatever he sees, talking no, no, to the guy. Before, yeah, well, yeah. That all how he. I want. I'm not gonna tell you that part yet. Though yeah. he's just how he's so good and he can do this and whatever. He doesn't need any help. By the way, he's never done this before. Never. He just watched the guy to do it and he, if do it and he thought that that looked easy to him. So he convinces this man that he's a professional. He takes out Josh and him, and they're oh, going. Oh, Josh! You didn't tell yeah. me Josh. Was oh there. yeah, and I was like, this is not fair to your brother because he will not know what to do out there if something happens. Don't go, whatever. Were they wearing life vests? Yes. Okay. So he gets to right to part because there's a a gate basically to the ocean to get the seaweed out from coming to the sand, and he gets to that place where he has to open he has to open the gate or whatever, and he stops because there's no more wind. He's like, I don't understand. It's not working now. I don't understand. I'm like, of course you don't understand because you don't have skill in this. <laughs> You've never done. And this I am either. on a paddleboard with Abigail, and I'm like having my I'm having a great time going back and forth, exercising, whatever. And I shout out to the guy that gave him this boat, and I was like. <laughs> He's stuck. He's like, well, you know, he's the captain. That's what he said. Mr. Captain knows how to sail the boat. And I was like, you know what, David? Good luck. In the end, he had to like drag the boat, swim it back to oh, the to shore to get the man to come back to take him out again. Exactly. This is more or less than an ego and not so much love. How did yeah, we get here? No, no, because the point is, what a, oh, the mean, art. We, we love David. <laughs> yeah. We love David. We love you, David, if you're listening to this episode. You're but, perfect. But, but I'm asking all of our listeners, don't be like David when it comes to to love. To love. Meaning, by the way, David, David's great in relationships, but my point is, there are people... Don't take most, that approach to love, uh, exactly. is what you're trying to say. Thank you. Thank you. Um, but that's no, but the, in my book, I, I reference um, the book Outliers, right? To be good at anything takes 10 years, which equates to 10,000 hours. And so if you start a relationship and you're thinking, wow, you know, I'm going to be great at this, really, have you been practicing this skill for 10 and years? I think, and this is, and this, and this practicing, is Practicing, so, nurturing, tending to it, watering it, growing it. And this cannot be said enough. If you're in a relationship for a week or a year, before you start worrying about, oh, is this going well, ask yourself the question, 
how many lessons of love are you learning every day? How much practice of love are you doing every day? The, it's, it's, it's ridiculous, and, and, and Eric Fromm speaks about this, that, that if this was any other art, most people would stop, because everybody's failing. But the fact that people assume or think that it is possible for love to grow, and for a relationship to, to flourish, without the investment of study Or even to be maintained. Forget about growing and flourishing. People don't understand that you are either going forward or backwards. It is right. not going to stay where you are at. So, if I can, I would like to, another quote from, from The Art of Loving. A second premise behind the attitude that there is nothing to be learned about love is the assumption that the problem of love is the problem of an object, not the problem of a faculty. People think that love is simple, but that to find the right object to love or to be loved by is difficult. So people, and this is the amazing thing, that people who are having trouble in love are focusing on the wrong problem. Right? They are saying, oh, I married the wrong woman. Oh, I can't find the right woman to date, and so on and so Rather forth. Rather than then, my inability. Am I developing the faculty to love? Am I developing love? And it's, again, like I said, this is something that cannot be stressed enough. And, and think about yourself, or think about people you know, how many people are actually spending the amount of time that they would spend practicing sailing, or practicing tennis, if they want to be good at it, on practicing and learning about love. It just doesn't happen. So then, what do you expect? It is kind of crazy. But I think, again, hopefully for our listeners, what we want to awaken is the understanding that love is an art, and be, therefore you have to be learning about it consistently, if you want to become better at it, and you have to be practicing it consistently, if you want to have the faculty, develop the faculty of love. It is a very, very yeah. important idea. My second lesson is kindness and thoughtful consideration fixes everything. Say that again. Kindness and thoughtful consideration in relationships can fix everything. Many of us know the famous line from Corinthians. Love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. Interestingly, I find that kindness is often over overlooked or unrelated. I'm sorry. Interestingly, I find that kindness is often overlooked or underrated. Maybe it seems like an obvious thing in relationships, but how many of us really practice that with our partners? Consistently. It is a daily practice. We may think we are kind people, but do we intentionally focus on growing and expressing our kindness? Kindness and thoughtful consideration lets the other person know that they are seen, and that they are heard, and that they are worthy. This is the number one complaint I hear from both sides in a couple. They, they use different words, like, I don't feel like I am desired, or I don't feel like they pay attention to me, I don't feel seen, heard, and that brings up so many things. It lets the other person, when you show your kindness, know that even after lots of time has passed, I am still paying attention to you, I am watching you, I am trying to get, you know, get to know you deeper and better, and I care. Grand sweeping gestures are not required, they are nice though, Rather, start paying attention. Take note of the seemingly small or trivial things about the other person, and consider ways in which you can celebrate these things, or use this information to be more mindful and loving. And if I can add to that, I think it is related to what we were saying before. Unless you are expressing love, you will never be able to experience love. And I think, again, this is a basic fallacy of people's understanding of love. But expressing love, just saying, I love you, is not even... No, 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 I, 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 I know, so you need to unpack that, no, no, because a lot... Of, this is, I had this conversation yesterday with a couple. I said, do you ever... Um, I said, do you ever say that, you know, I love you every day? Do you say it every day? I said, do you compliment her? And he said, yes. And then we went on to a different topic, different details, and then she said, well... When I say, do you love me, you say you do. And when I ask you if I look pretty, you say yes. <laughs> oh, that is the worst. But but that was their understanding of, you know, and she didn't think much of it, but that's why she was still starving for it, because it's it's received very differently, right? If I ask the question versus if you feel something overwhelming and you share that. But kindness is really unconditional love in action. You know, it's right. really showing up for the person, especially when you don't feel like it. Kindness, I, I just I think it's so underrated. I don't think it's spoken enough well, about so at all in well, relationships. So let's make this even more practical for our listeners. What you're saying to those who are in a relationship, certainly, again, whether it's new or, 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 or for some time, ask yourself the question, 
when you're when you're thinking about the relationship and maybe you even have doubts or questions or complaints, ask yourself the question, how often consistency, right? Because it's not about the even even being kind once a year or once a month or once a week. How consistent are your actions of kindness towards your partner, towards the person you 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 desire to receive love from? And again, just going back to what I was saying before is that it is impossible to have to receive love unless you are giving kindness, which, like you said, is love in action. Very, very important. I remember, I mean, you're you're a really kind person, and I'm oh, thank you. I'm really grateful for that, honestly. Um, and I think one of the most recent times that stand out in my mind is it was the first week of the surgery for my foot. And I couldn't get my my leg wet from the knee down, and I had to like put myself in the bathtub, lift myself out. It was just, I was on it was so difficult, and I and you helped with all of that, and you didn't complain. You did it with so much um, care. But I remember there was it was like the fourth day in, and I was just like feeling all the feelings, and I realized that wow, this is going to be a longer recovery than I thought. So I was kind of mourning some things, and I was. I started crying and you had such, and as I'm getting in the bath and I'm like, oh, and I'm trying to like, and you're like, let it all out. It's okay. You know, it's totally normal to cry. Like this is, yes, I get it. Like you, but you were so caring and compassionate and empathetic. And I felt your kindness and I felt your love. And it's just a small example, but that's really what we're talking about. This is another idea that cannot be uh, stated enough. And I really hope that all of our listeners ourselves included, but all of our listeners as well, really take this to heart. And really, it's it's about practicing kindness on a consistent basis. I'd like to also, one more quote from uh, The Art of Loving. The third error leading to the assumption that there is nothing to be learned about love lies in the confusion between the initial experience of falling in love and the permanent state of being in love. Right, that euphoric feeling. Or as we might better say, of standing in love. Interesting. I don't love the phrase standing, though. He, uh, I don't know what that yeah. means. Being in love, I prefer to standing in love. But anyway, if two people who have been strangers, as all of us are, suddenly let the wall between them break down and feel close, feel one, this moment of oneness is one of the most exhilarating, most exciting experiences in life. So he's talking about vulnerability, really. Right. But he's talking about what happens initially, right? They sort of, the, the dichotomy between the initial. Well, everybody starts out as strangers. That's the interesting exactly. thing. And they'll only get as close as you let them. Even if you get married or whatever, you decide to live together, they'll still only get as close as you let them. Right. But the point is that there's, there's something very powerful about that initial coming down of the wall, which is often lost in the rest of the, of the being in love. So he says, um, this moment of oneness right, is one of the most exhilarating. It is all the more wonderful and miraculous for persons who have been shut off, isolated without love. This miracle of sudden intimacy is often facilitated if it is combined with or initiated by sexual attraction and consummation. However, this type of love is by its very nature not lasting. The two persons become well acquainted. Their intimacy loses more and more of its miraculous character until their antagonism, their disappointments, their mutual boredom kill whatever is left of the initial excitement. Yet in the beginning, they do not know all this. In fact, they take the intensity of the infatuation, this being crazy about each other, for proof of the intensity of their love, while it may only prove the degree of their preceding loneliness. As you're talking, I'm reading um, Marcel Proust's Swan in Love, and I'm not that far enough, but the the one part that I I really find interesting is he starts the book about, you know, he, he loves women, he's with all kinds of women, the cook, the this, that, it goes in, like, in, and about attraction, and, you know, um, he's handsome, he's well-to-do, but he starts to fall in love with somebody he's not attracted to because she awakens parts of him that had not been awakened. And he finds himself longing for after they've had a cup of tea together, a conversation in a way that he never knew he could experience or feel love. I, and I love the way he writes, right? Yeah. So, um, but it's it's like that. Right. And I've, I might have, I'm not sure. And he's sure starting that. to, I mean, you have to hear how he, he describes her looks at the beginning, but then he starts to not see even how she looks because something greater that's rooted in something real emerges. Absolutely. It reminds me of one of my more favorite stories about love. 
and the, this story is told, it's kind of a parable, but a man who is sitting with his friend, and they are at a restaurant, and the, the, the man starts talking to his friend about how much he loves fish. Like there is nobody in the world who loves fish more than him, and he knows exactly this, this fish that he loves, and this is the fish that he loves the most, and he, the waiter comes, and the guy you know, does not know about cooking and all this, and, and, and the, so he says, I would like to order this fish, and he tells his friend, because this is my favorite fish, and they bring the fish, obviously it is dead, and it is cooked, and his friend said, what are you doing? <laughs> he said, what do you mean, what am I doing? I told you, this is the lo- fish that I love the most. He says, is this the way you treat somebody you love? You have them killed, and cooked, and now you are going to consume them? Right? But the reality is, that this is our confusion of love. It, somebody else uses the example of flowers, right? A flower that you like, you cut and put in a vase so you can enjoy it. A flower you love, you keep it in the ground and you water it and take care of it. And I think this shift is, is the biggest chasm for most people going from what really isn't love, it's some form of infatuation, it's some form of selfishness into a real relationship, which is taking care, the kindness, like you said before. And, and the reality is that unless you can sit, and by the way, you can, this isn't a one day choice. We are all basically uh, have a tremendous selfishness to us, which means that we will naturally go back towards that type of love that we think is love, which really is just me taking uh, from the other person. And if there's no more for me to take, I'm no longer in love, and so, et cetera, which is not really love, towards that other, right? Really, flower, watering, taking care, learning more, everything we said until now. I think it is such a, again, I, I think, again, this is such an important difference that unfortunately we do not often understand, but even if we do, we do not often focus on what it takes to really be somebody who loves and be somebody who therefore can truly experience real love. And I want to leave you to this last one. This is the one I am most excited about. You hold each other accountable for each of your personal growth. Now, this doesn't sound sexy and it doesn't sound like love, but let me tell you, this is the bind that glues. Marriage or real commitment means being committed to growing together. We're not meant to stay the same. We're, we're meant to change and change can feel scary. After all, how can we know if the person we become will be loved? How can we know we will love the person my spouse becomes? The knowing comes from a commitment to growing together, to hold each other accountable for that growth, to see to it that the love that you have for each other doesn't only make you feel better, but inspires you to be better every day. And that's just golden. And not just to each other, but to yourselves and all those whose path your love will cross. I think that so many people don't talk about this aspect that is so necessary to have in a relationship, because as I said in the beginning, change is the only constant. You are either growing forward or backwards. You are either growing in proactive ways that you choose or in reaction to something that has happened, good or bad, either to hurt or to trauma. We are always changing every single second of the day. In fact, on a cellular level, in this moment, you and I, all of us, are changing. So to not have that conversation and be naive, to think, I mean, it always gets me when I counsel people, they are like, you know, it's not the person I married. I'm like, uh, yeah. The crazy thing, Why do you expect them there, there, to be? There are some people who think that that's what they would be happy with. If that same person stayed the same from when they were whatever, five years ago, ten years ago, twenty years ago, when they got married. And that's when you really start to see the holes in, in the relationship, right? Well, this person now is having a spiritual awakening, for instance, and the other person has no desire and wants to leave everything the same, or somebody desires to lose a lot of weight, and maybe they're both an overweight couple, and then what does that mean for the other? Like, we have so many ideas around keeping, holding on to love, keeping it close, suffocating it really. And again, that is not unconditional love. We are meant to grow and change individually. Relationships are the best and the strongest when you're able to grow side by side together and you have those conversations and you hold each other accountable. And your support, and going back, and it's related to what we said before, the reason, one of the reasons why that is so important is because you're going outside of yourself. You're not thinking simply, what is my partner, spouse giving to me? You are aware of the fact that one of the main reasons why I'm with this other person is because we both need to grow. And I want to help them grow, and I hope that they support and and encourage my growth. It's outside of me, once again. It's another action of kindness. It's another action of the art, learning the art of, of love. And I think it's, again, like you said, I don't know that a let me put it this way. I do not believe that a relationship can truly become what it is meant to become 
as fulfilling and flourishing as it's meant to be, unless both partners are committed both to change and growth and to assisting the other in that. And then I just want to just in conclusion, just globally, right on a on a bigger picture scale, love is really the essence of spirituality. It's the essence of our soul. It's who we are, actually. And expanding our capacity for love is the essence of our spiritual work in this world. And we've all heard the the premise, love thy neighbor as thyself. The great Kabbalist, the Hillel, was once tested by one of his students who came to him and asked, if you're so learned, tell me the entire meaning of the Bible and do it while standing on one leg. Hillel raised his foot off the ground and replied, love thy neighbor as thyself, the rest is commentary. Now go and learn. The sentiment that's shared by many sages, scholars, teachers, and it's the golden rule. And I, I think that this is a really good exercise um, on this Valentine's Day or really any day to invite our listeners to make a list of all the people in your life who you're closest to, relatives, friends, children, a partner. Next to each of their names, I want you to list one thing you could do to expand your capacity to love for this person. One thing. Maybe you haven't called your mom in a few days. Maybe there's a friend you keep meaning to get together with. Whatever it is. So make that list. And then I want you to make a second list of all the people you feel the furthest from. Coworkers who you might not get along with, in-laws. What's something nice you can do for them? And I've practiced this, by the way. I've done very, very kind things for people who have been very not nice to me. And you know what happens? What? My heart opens up and it melts. And I become the recipient of the love that I was looking for. They become actually anger, angry and bitter because I'm not sure what to do with that. <laughs> It's a real, you know, imagine somebody you're hating on is now showing you kindness. It's really uncomfortable for that person. But try this. And by the way, again, it's not for them. It's totally for you. Because that act of kindness has the capacity to build bridges where there were once walls. Whether or not they receive it with happiness is not the point. Again, expect that they probably won't. The point is that it's going to melt your own heart. You cannot do something kind for another person and not simultaneously expand your capacity for care for that individual no matter how you may have seen them before that moment. It's a really powerful thing to experience and to practice. You know, people are on Valentine's Day thinking about... And Just again, that romantic, you know... What, what, am, what am I going to... I'm yeah. How, well, how, am I gonna, how am I going to get more love? And even often, if they do actions of buying flowers or candies or chocolates, whatever, it's about, I'm going to do this so that I can get more love. And what you're saying, which I think, again, is so important and really in line with everything we said until now, which is, how do we learn the art of love? Ask yourself the question, what am I doing to show love towards, towards others? And I would say, maybe even separate from which, whoever you're in a relationship with, if you're not you care about, love, yeah. if you're not happy in your relationship, maybe the first thing you need to do is, is expand your ability to love. And that is by actions towards people outside of your relationship. And I would say this, unless you're consistently expressing love in one way or another, kindness, words, to others, outside of your relationship, you will not be able to have the relationship you're meant to have. But again, expressing love, but an expression that grows and evolves every day. It can't be the same expression of love. No, of course. And I'm not even talking about to your partner, right? To be clear, this is to your friend. But it has to, your, to feel to your... expansive. It has to feel like something's opening up in you. Right. And it may be a vulnerability. Maybe, you know, that person upset you earlier in the day. But to really bring yourself back to truth, right? rooted in appreciation and, and clarity and, and to express that. Right. So what I would say to our listeners is, and this is the good news is, that if you're in a relationship, it can be so much more. If you're not in a relationship, you have certainly the ability to find the most amazing soulmate and partner. And but, if you're really unhappy in your relationship, push pause for a second and start evaluating the relationship you have with yourself. And ask yourself, what can I do to learn and to practice love? Because only in that process can you ever possibly come to a state of experiencing the relationship you're meant to have. Happy Valentine's Day. Happy Valentine's Day. As always, a reminder to continue to send your questions, comments, stories, romantic stories, questions about love to Monica and Michael at Kabbalah.com to continue to share this podcast with everybody you know. Go to Apple Podcasts, write five-star reviews and share especially this one with all those that you actually love. This might be your action of kindness. And as always, I hope you enjoyed recording. 
I hope you enjoyed listening to this podcast as much as we enjoyed recording. Stay spiritually hungry.